Grab your beverages and turn up your interweb. Solving the world's problems 12 ounces at a time. It's Dudes and Beer. Well, hello everybody and welcome to episode 268 of the Dudes and Beer podcast, now officially brought to you by podcastcadet.com. If you're into podcasts like I am, want to start a podcast for yourself, friends, family, business, fun, whatever, stop on by podcastcadet.com today. They can help you out. Everything from the hows and what to do technologically to how to start a website to branding, marketing, uh, digital distribution, monetization, the whole package, one-on-one consultation with you is what they do. Use the code DUDES20 on your way out the door to save 20% off your purchase. That website, again, is podcastcadet.com. The code is DUDES20. I am Chris Jordan, your host. Tonight, our very good friend, uh, Dr. John Hall, is returning to talk more about COVID updates, uh, all the new science that we are finding out, as well as quite a few dudes and beer called at moments. Uh, We have have quite a few of those going on uh, since his first appearance for COVID in episode 258 and his follow-up in episode 262, which was epically long. Um, Tons of calls from all over the world. We really need to do that again. But we'll be getting with John Hall here in just a minute. Uh, right now, we have a great uh, report from John Bound that totally missed my radar a couple weeks ago um, that really lays a lot of this down. Let's hear what John Bound from Daily News Collective has to say about all of this. As the shock and awe continues its reign of terror across America, we have to ask at some point, how did we get here? Well, this is from Dr. Fauci, who wrote last month, If one assumes that the number of asymptomatic or minimally symptomatic cases is several times as high as the number of reported cases, the case fatality rate may be considerably less than 1%, and COVID-19 may ultimately be more akin to those of the severe seasonal influenza pandemic. Well, the seasonal flu's mortality rate is just 0.1%. So again, We've gone from possibly 3.4%, which is millions dying, to perhaps closer to 0.1%. See why it's important to let the data come in? Even CNN's Dr. Sanjay Gupta had to admit today that as bad as things can get, and they're getting pretty bad, especially in New York and some of these other hot spots, we do need to keep our perspective here. Well, the vast majority of people, even if you're elderly, aren't going to need hospitalization. The vast majority are going to recover. The vast majority are not going to die. 2019 began with an ironic excavation of the altar and statue of Shipe Totec, the Aztec flayed god of agriculture and disease, whose worshippers wore the skin of sacrificed slaves for 20 days. This random archaeological event quietly set the tone in retrospect for what was to come. Meanwhile, exercises for a pandemic scenario codenamed Crimson Contagion began in January and ran until August of 2019. Roughly a dozen federal agencies operating in 12 states along with the American Red Cross, American Nurses Association, and the Mayo Clinic used the premise of a global flu epidemic originating in Chicago to identify weaknesses in the face of a real pandemic. The New York Times reported the simulation sobering results contained in a draft report dated October 2019 that has not previously been reported drove home just how underfunded, underprepared, and uncoordinated the federal government would be for a life or death battle with a virus for which no treatment existed. The draft report marked not to be disclosed laid out in stark detail repeated cases of confusion in the exercise. Federal agencies jockeyed over who was in charge, state officials and hospital struggled to figure out what kind of equipment was stockpiled or available. Cities and states went their own ways on school closings. Sound familiar? And then the Johns Hopkins Center for Health Security, in partnership with the World Economic Forum and the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, hosted Event 201. Good morning, and thank you all for being part of this pandemic emergency board. It began in healthy-looking pigs months, perhaps years ago. This audio is actually from their event. Spread silently within herds. Gradually, farmers started getting sick. 
Infected people got a respiratory illness with symptoms ranging from mild flu-like signs to severe pneumonia. The sickest required intensive care. Many died. It's not just about handing people a piece of knowledge. It's also about how we incentivize them to manage their behaviors, which in any communicable disease outbreak, behavior of one sort will minimize your chance of getting a disease versus behavior of another sort, which may maximize that chance. Alarming news emerging from social media companies today about the CAPS pandemic. Twitter and Facebook are reporting they've identified and deleted a disturbing number of accounts dedicated to spreading disinformation about the outbreak. For more on this, we go to our correspondent, Catalina Parks. Chen, these accounts were created by several state-sponsored groups intending to sow political discord, and some individuals are seemingly seeking to gain financial advantages. Violence against healthcare workers and minority populations has been increasing. A recent riot highlights the real danger in these posts. The elite Event 201 had the money and the self-proclaimed experts. But why has nothing actually come from it in real time? Was it simply warning a small group of elites what was coming? Time and time again, drills are exercised by the elite and governments months before an actual horrific event occurs. How long will we allow these white-collar criminals to practice their manipulation of the taxpaying public with blatant exercises of unspeakable tragedy? John Bound reporting. John Bound is always just straight, straight up in your face with it. Um... I love John Bounds so much as a man, as a reporter. Um, thank you for laying that out. Uh, we first talked about this uh, in the episode with John Bound, the fact that there was a Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation study done to simulate something like mirror image to COVID that came out shortly before this happened. Um, Dr. John Hall, welcome to the show. Uh, as always, how are you doing, my friend? Good. How are you doing, Chris? Doing great, man. Isn't it, isn't it just strange that there is always some sort of pandemic drill or something like that just before this lights off? Like even the even the news footage that you heard there, folks, where it was like, let's go to our reporter talking about this. All of that was literally content that was made for the drill for that. Um, they literally, like the exact same thing happened on social media with this, the exact same thing. Um, it's kind of disturbing, um, <laughs> you know, where it's like foreign actors are using social media to stir discord amongst the people. Like how many headlines have you seen about that in the last week, doc? Oh, every day. Yeah. And then when when you're on Facebook, you're, there's multiple posts on it as well. So yeah, yeah, and it's just it's literally all over the place, everywhere that we go. Um, and you know, it was one of those I don't know how that report from John Bound slipped past my radar. Um, but we had talked about it with him. We talked about it with you. And it was one of those like, wow. And then to see that right up around the same time that the huge swarm of locusts started in Africa and started working its way to China. And as this started that, wow, they happened to, you know, un uncover the Aztec God of, <laughs> of the harvest and pestilence. Um, so yeah, yeah. Just really wild stuff all kind of lining up there. But, um, interesting to see the fact that this scenario that they played out, played out so similar to, the actual way that things are working in our society right now. Well, and I, the, what you missed out on too, is I think we're gathering up the murder hornets to try to combat the locust swarms. So. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Um, I loved the meme that came out where it was the guy looking at the girl and it was like murder hornets 2020. And then the COVID girl was all angry with him. Um, his girlfriend in the image. He was like, yeah, that's good stuff. Because, um, of course, the murder hornets have taken over uh, the the meme threads as of late. So, um, <laughs> but, you know, when, when you first came on to talk about this, Doctor, um, it was episode 258, uh, and that was February 25th, actually. That was Tuesday, February 25th. And at that point, 
um, we made it pretty clear with our belief in the the science that, well, you know, whoa, volumes more science on this than I do. But even with my deductive reasoning science um, and the fact that this was so much closer to the cold than the common flu, um, just protein relation wise, that we would be looking at a huge number of mutations very rapidly. Um, and we are right up against that right now. Yeah. I mean, we, uh, had a lot of things that we talked about at that time in February, which, you know, for those of your listeners, remember, I, I am a physician. So I, some of the things I look at a little bit differently and, and try to keep the politics out of what my decision making and especially in clinical practice are, Mm. um, and that's the scary thing with this virus is a lot of what you're seeing on Facebook and CNN and Fox and all the media outlets, you always have to remember that with a grain of salt, think about what they're telling you and then reevaluate and look things up and research it yourself because a lot of times the the story that you get in the media has a slant one way or the other direction for a reason. Um, and that a lot of times is who's profiting, you know, who stands to have you out of work or have you quarantined the longest and, you know, and things like that. And, you know, not to downplay the virus because there are certain areas that got hit hard by it, but there's a lot of areas that didn't get, get hard by it. And, you know, a lot of the facts are that, you know, some of the stats and some of the models of how fatal this was going to be as it spread have obviously turned out to be way exaggerated as well. So, yeah, yeah. And, you know, even, even to hear Sanjay Gupta, um, Back, back walking his initial response and saying that, you know, uh, we're looking at a very slim number of people getting it and a very slim number of people, even slimmer, slimmer number of people dying from it. Um, so, the, and, and that is not to diminish the people that have died, folks. That is not to, that is not to, to say that... Um, what we are facing is a tragedy, that it is a huge health crisis, unlike we have seen. Um, that is all absolute truth. Um, there is there is no conspiracy going on here. There is a virus spreading amongst people. Correct, doctor? Well, and, and that's, that is the truth. But the truth is also that you know about these deaths because you're being bombarded with it on Facebook and in the, yeah. the major media every day. What you don't hear about were all the deaths with SARS. You know, you and I both were alive yeah. for SARS yeah. and swine flu, and, yeah. and a lot of people died from that, but the media wasn't covering it the way they covered this. And a lot of people die from the regular influenza A and B um, every year, but it's not in your face with the media. And that's what you always have to kind of keep in mind when you're watching the news is, mm. you know, it's it's real easy to say, you know what? Our society is violent and there's a murder on every corner. Well, you know, if you really look at the stats, murder rates have gone down and violent crime has gone down. And I mean, it's it, it's really easy to propagandize something on the media and make it seem worse than it really is. And now, like I said, that's not to downplay, downplay the deaths of people that did get in and people that lost loved ones. But, you know, the same people who are really at risk for death by COVID are the same ones that were dying every year from influenza A and B as well, too. So Yeah, and they were, uh, you know, mostly people uh, in the greater percentile uh, that, that had pre-existing conditions, that had respiratory issues to begin with, things like that. Of course, there have been the stray, random 30-year-olds, um, stuff like that, but it's been really strange to see the fact that um, kids aren't really getting it in great numbers, you know, um, I, as I said before the show, I'm actively looking right now so I can put it in the dudes and beer store where we can all go to buy our, our Madonna bodies. Um, cause of course, Madonna <laughs> said that she had the antibodies that would stop it. So, um, you know, I, I need my ampule of Madonna bodies, uh, to, to help out with this just in case, you know, um, but we, let's, let's go ahead and start cracking into, some of episode 258 and our called it moments real quick. I've actually gone through and gathered some of these. Um, and 
let's let's give this a real quick listen doc this is about two or three minutes long um and you'll hear some beeps in here folks those are the moments of edit where i literally skipped like 15 minutes of conversation but uh you'll hear quite a bit of what you're hearing actively going on the in the news right now um what we're talking about coming to possibly be in episode 258 uh on february 25th here we go with the concept of it being similar to the common cold and also being a flu uh these are things that mutate regularly and i think i think that's really a lot of the concern right now is is the mutation factor and you know by the time that we do begin to come up with some kind of vaccine it will have mutated already well and you got to remember too that um i think they've pretty well narrowed it down that it is a bat virus and you know there's another yeah really horrible virus called hendra virus that comes from the bats too yeah um that they've been working with in bls for laboratories but um there were no bats being sold at the land market the wet market uh, and but they were experimenting on bats at the wuhan virology lab uh so um not that it was weaponized but it may have been an accidental release from there because it had to get from the animal host to a human host. And the, the first death yeah. was someone who hadn't been to the Wuhan market, but you have to yeah. have as close as you can to the initial, you know, virus DNA component um, that initially affected humans. Because as you said, it can mutate, it mutates when it goes to an animal host or a human host, and it can mutate again as it goes from human to human host. So far they're saying that they think the mutations have stabilized, but, like we said, you know, what the mutation you see in Italy may be different from what you see in this country. It may be different mutations in between cultural groups, you know, or ethnic groups. <clears throat> so that's the thing to watch out. You know, viruses are pretty smart little devils. You know, viruses and prions oh, God, are yeah. really about the, sm- the smallest thing we have that can be considered a living. Yeah. Um, well, and, and they're good. And, and we do. We work with them here to, to weaponize them as well as other countries, too. As far as the the theories that possibly it's a weaponized virus. I can't say that it was really weaponized. I can say that they were doing research on that coronavirus from those bats in Wuhan. They do have the bats there. Absolutely. And there were scientists there that were actually doing research to figure out ways for that virus to bind irreversibly to lung protein to make it more virulent. You know, so... You know, is it possible that it was a weaponized form of it that somehow escaped that lab? Yes. You're always a little suspect whenever you see a zoonotic virus that's never been seen in human transmission before. Yeah. All of a sudden become human transmission. Now, yes, they do have a virology lab that, you know, like we have them here too, that, that their job is to investigate these viruses, not only for treatment and prevention in case they ever do get into the human population, but they're also used militarily to weaponize viruses. So sure. The fact, the fact that one of these viruses jumped from a bat to one person in the Wuhan China area where there happens to be a virology lab, you know, at the risk of sounding conspiratorial, it sounds like probably that that was possibly a manipulated virus to me. <laughs> You got to love the Wayback Machine there. Uh, what, do you, what, do you, what do you think there, Doc? Uh, you think we did all right? Yeah, well, you know, it's what I didn't mention at the time was that the um, University of North Carolina, you know, had a little bit of play in the, the bats being researched at, mm-hmm. at the Wuhan Virology Lab as well. And sure. If you, look at every, if you look at everything else that China did, after the fact, <clears throat> I know the the major media, CNN, MSNBC, I know they, they just want so badly for this to have just been somebody that, you know, ate bat soup or somehow another came in contact with a bat in the wild. And that one person all of a sudden was able to spread this. Yeah. <clears throat> Nobody that practices medicine is going to buy that. That's just not the way viruses spread. You know, at least not as quickly as this one did, yeah. you know, and, and so globally. But 
Um, you know, there there was a, a physician or a researcher at uh, Wuhan Virology Lab that actually mentioned uh, this horseshoe bat virus back yep. in the earliest was 2013, and the 2015 is when she mentioned it again in conjunction with the University of North Carolina. So, um, and for you know, those of your listeners that are wondering what kind of bat this is, a horseshoe bat is in Yunnan province. That's, uh, I think her last last name is pronounced she, uh, S-H-I, <clears throat> actually yep. took some bat feces from a cave in Yunnan province. For those of you who want to know the distance between the wet market at Wuhan and Yunnan province where the bat cave was, it would be about like driving across Texas to get there. <clears throat> it's approximately a little over a day's drive from Wuhan Market. I mean, it's it's seventeen hundred kilometers or something like that. But um, I mean, it's that bat wasn't being sold as a meat product in Wuhan Market, obviously. Yeah. And um, and she did bring back bat feces. Yeah, that is uh, out for- just so you know, five hours, five hours. So yeah, that is yeah. like and it, that's a good distance. Yeah, and it's and it, and she figured out pretty quickly that um, this virus that uh, well actually there are several coronaviruses that they isolated from the horseshoe bat, but she figured out pretty quickly that they were all pretty virulent. And as a matter of fact, a researcher from the University of North Carolina even mentioned in the paper in 2015 that uh, this particular COVID or um, coronavirus that we're dealing with now was extremely transmissible to humans with no treatment known. And that was in 2015. So um, that's why our intelligence agencies are really looking in the five eyes report that was recently came out that for those of you that don't know, the five eyes are basically our agreement between us, Canada, Great Britain, Australia, and New Zealand to be able to legally spy on each other. Um, those for my writings on targeted individuals and full spectrum surveillance, those people know exactly what the five eyes are. Yeah. Um, it's an agreement where our government can't, is not supposed to spy on us. So Canada spies on us and gives yeah. the information to our government. Canada is not supposed to spy on Canadians. So we spy on Canadians and give the information to Canada. That's the way that works. Yeah. And, um, and if you look at their report, CNN is really focusing on the part that says, well, there's a probability that it came from the virology lab in Wuhan, but, you know, it also could be natural transmission from from bat to human. Well, most of the country's intelligence agencies are looking at that report and going, it came out of the virology lab. That's why we have... Well, I was going to say, you know, I I don't know a whole heck of a lot, Doc. I don't... I I did not... I don't have letters before or after my name separated by commas or dots um but but i'm pretty sure that whenever a a zoonotic virus makes that jump um that it does not spread so virulently at least not right off um i i I can't imagine the fact that i mean it just it just jumped into a new host it just jumped into a new biology like it, it could, could it even be possible to spread that fast? And that's why, you know, there's investigation right now as to uh, when did things actually start? How much was China suppressing? How long were they suppressing it? All that kind of stuff. Um, because, yeah. Well, and when a, when a virus is that virulent, that's the ideal weapon. You don't have to weaponize it. Yeah, yeah, You just exactly. have to figure out a way to spread it. Yeah, yeah. And and just so you know, folks, we aren't just talking out the wazoo here. Um, I mean, Trump pulled the NIH grant for coronavirus research. This is this is straight up out of ABC News um, over ties to the Wuhan lab at the heart of conspiracy theories. The title of the article says, because, yeah, the Wuhan lab is at the heart of a lot of theories right now. A lot of hypotheses, let's say, because it's not theories. Uh I think I think we're just about past the point of theory now. Um, like you said, it's it's pretty hard to say, "Hey, Jeffrey Dahmer, who killed all these people under your house?" Um, yeah, <laughs> you know. Yeah, and I think I did mention it just that way. You did, you did. Um, <laughs> and 
you know, like whenever whenever we have the the case of the good doctor at Harvard, um, who who was arrested at the beginning of the year and actively told the FBI straight up, um, I and it it had totally I I had missed it in my numerous scan readings of articles the way that I do. Um, but he actively told the FBI that without without knowledge of the university, he went to Wuhan and helped set up a lab that, quote, specialized in nanotechnology. Yep. End quote. Um, millions of dollars coming from China into the the University of Harvard or Harvard University, rather. Um unreported to the U.S. government, and this guy was basically going back and forth helping build a lab unbeknownst to the university, which means unbeknownst to the government. Um, yeah, uh, who knows what they're playing with? Who knows what international treaties they are not abiding by when playing with it? Um, who knows what kind of nanotechnology they're even talking about? Um, because nanotechnology has fully entered into the realm of viral research, medicine, everything else. Well, and for your listeners that may not be following it real close or getting most of their information straight from CNN or, or various propagandists that are actually just regurgitating mm. propaganda on, on Facebook, just look at the facts. Hey. So you have you have a virology center in Wuhan, China, experimenting or, or researching from, you know, a day's ride away from, yeah. you know, that market in China. And that's the only place they are. So they had to have came from there. And uh, then you have this COVID-19 that we know comes from that bat. The University of North Carolina was working on it. They knew it was transmissible from human to human. Even 2015, they said that this virus will go from bat to human and there's no, no stopping it from doing that. Um, so all of a sudden the virus is out and, um, China basically doesn't shut down Wuhan. As a matter of fact, they let 50,000 people fly out of there on international flights. Yeah. We, you know, we offered to send the CDC there, um, to try to help, you know, with some of the viral problems that they were having, because it was looking like it had the possibility to become a pandemic. Yeah. They wouldn't let us in. They wouldn't send us viral samples. One of the two of the doctors that tried to warn the global population what was happening in Wuhan disappear. One of them died. One of them disappeared. One of them yeah. died of the coronavirus. You know, then it turns out that their importation of PPE, personal protective equipment, mask, gown, contaminated um, sh shoe covers and things. Well, but before they admitted that there was human to human transmission, all of their imports went up anywhere from 72 to a hundred percent. Yeah. So they were they were stockpiling PPE for their own country ahead of time, you know, expecting it to break out there before they warned the rest of the world because they knew there would end up being a shortage on masks. And while, and, while at the yeah. same time being the main producer of PPE worldwide. Yeah. Yeah. And and that's just it. And that's, you know, it's interesting, um, John, the 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 u.s defense officials i've got it here from new york post um u.s defense officials are eyeing potential threat of coronavirus as a bioweapon and that that's literally saying that like coronavirus tainted uh, like imagine it going back to the post 9 11 days where we were talking about tainted envelopes going through the mail things like that um you know and and the first thing i said was Great, we're getting all these tests. Um, are they tainted? Are they are they pre COVID for us? You know, just to save us the time. All of them that were getting shipped over to us from China um, ends up. Yeah, they were. Um, <laughs> and you know, now now I'm not saying that's a fruit of a poison tree situation, or the or that the Chinese were were trying to go trail of tears on us. Let's just say from our own horrible ox ridden history as Americans. Um, like we, we of all people should understand that, that method of doing something, you know, uh, <laughs> the, just that, 
dirty, underhanded, sneaky method of, oh, so you need something to help? All right. Sure, we'll help you. (laughs) You know? Um, And then slide something in that is totally infected and will help take care of things in the process. Um, And I'm not saying that is what happened, but it is definitely something that our intelligence agencies are actively looking at now. Well, and they have to look at it that way because the way it spread so quickly and went into Europe and and now it's looking like, you know, there were probably cases already here in December and mm-hmm. January. Um, oh, you know, yeah, now they my, found a lady my, in Cali- California that has an even more virulent, more contagious strain of it. Yeah. Um, with and, it has manipulated all on its own. And and that's just it, Doc. Between Between when it first popped up and when you came on on February 25th, at that point there was an... And mutation one that we knew of, and it had it had thank God mutated into something less virulent, right? And now we're looking at the one that I sent that we both cross sent to each other today, hilariously, yeah. <laughs> where scientists say a now dominant strain of the original coronavirus appear or of the coronavirus appears to be more contagious than the original. Um, that was released just today from the L.A. Times. Um, and at the same time, a few days ago, was the announcement from the U.S. Germ Warfare Research Leads to say that they have a new early COVID-19 test that could possibly presumptively positive test people before they are as- before they are symptomatic. Um, the, these things just like the. It's it's not a whole lot of hammering on these puzzle pieces to me, um, <laughs> to to no, make a picture. But you have to re- you, you have to remember, and especially your listeners, when you're watching the major media, yes, and you're being forced at this, where they're saying, "Well, no, no, this is all natural," and you know, it's one one guy got infected somehow from a bat. Of course, the no, nobody can say how, but you know, that's their story mm. that it was just somehow it was must have been the wet market, and somebody must have had a bat there, and. Somehow that virus got to that one guy. Yeah, he infected the, 50,000 other people who got on planes to go to different countries internationally to infect 50,000 more people in each one of those countries. I mean, it just, well, and, you know, and, along, and, and along with China's response to it all, there's just no way. <laughs> yeah, well, and don't forget the, uh, the original story and the original hypothesis was that it spread from a bat to a pangolin to us um and and i that may have very well been to to just cover that gap that you're talking about um yeah because because and, and pangolin, so you, pangolins so are readily know, sold I, at the wet market um and just so everybody just so everybody knows where i live i live within about can almost hit it with a rock i'm probably a tenth of a mile as the crow flies from the largest bat cave in yep. North America. Yeah. Yeah. There's about 20 million bats come out of that cave every night yep. to go. And, and I've been, and I've been there. It's in Bracken, Texas. You can sit there. You, well, used to, you can't right now because it's closed because of COVID. Yeah. <laughs> because of what that. Well, because but, there's uh, a bunch of or, bats or, or, in there. <laughs> or, ordinarily, you can go sit there and watch these bats come out and they catch bugs and poop all over you and everything well, while they're coming out. And just and, to give uh, you an idea. Catch them and owls catch them. Yeah, and I mean, no one's ever caught it, caught a, a yeah. virus from those bats. And as a matter of fact, before it was a, a conservancy, back in World War One, people used to go down into those caves and and mine the bat guano to make gunpowder. Oh, absolutely. And, you know, you know, and they all lived. You know, they yep. weren't they weren't getting any weird viruses being down there and all that bat guano. Yeah. So I mean, you can be around bats. I'm around them every night because they fly all around where, where I'm at. Sure. And you can be around their poop. And I guess unless you're just maybe consuming it or rubbing it into open wounds, you know, you're, I mean, the transmission of a virus from a, yeah. a flying mammal to a human well, would be a pretty you would, rarity. You would have to be handling them with great regularity. Um, and like, I'm, I'm, I'm a herpophile. Uh, for those of you that don't know what that means, that means I love reptiles and amphibians. Um, I'm trying to raise and educate my son properly. 
uh, especially living here in Texas with snakes and poisonous snakes, which ones you can touch, which ones you can't play with. But even that good habit of being a herpophile and knowing that, um, you know, reptiles and amphibians regularly carry salmonella, whenever you get done handling a toad and you put it back in the garden, go wash your hands. Yeah. <laughs> go wash your hands thoroughly. Sing happy birthday um, while you wash your hands with uh, water as hot as you can stand it. If it's not steaming, then wash it twice as long. Um, but that's how you kill it. That's how you do things. Um, if you're handling bats, there are absolutely precautions. Same thing. You know, like I used to help with some wildlife rescue. Whenever you're done putting a raccoon out, you ain't just going out and eating a hamburger. You know, you're going to, you're going to, same thing with primates. Yeah. And, like you know, you're everybody gonna, wants to, you know, and I, and I've owned primates. I've actually, have like you own a fox right now. You yeah. own general Rommel, but, yeah, general but, Rommel's the coolest pet ever. Everybody, everybody wants those little pocket monkeys. And let me tell you, there are primate viruses that hey, will man. kill you. Hey, the pri- primates have their own, uh, their own list of herpes viruses. Yeah, herpes B virus uh, is one of them, and it will kill humans. No, between, between movies like Monkey Shines and Outbreak and everything else, there ain't one monkey movie out there where things turn out good. Um, I ain't trusting no monkey in my house. <laughs> <laughs> I know how to treat a snake bite. I do not know what to do for a monkey bite, doctor. Uh, <laughs> sorry, kid. But it's it's just been interesting to see. Um, and I told my wife earlier, like when 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 she came in yesterday and uh, I was going through transcript and hot key searching stuff and then finding the finding the minutes and then going into the clip and grabbing that and making our clips for tonight um she was like my my god what why do you have to be right about all that that's scary as hell (laughs) and it's like yeah it is it is kind of scary and like i told her the burden of knowledge sometimes can be rough and i'm not saying that like we're right 100 percent of the time folks but we called quite a bit of what go is actively going on right now um right now we are looking at literally a mutation per country just about um at a minimum at a minimum the the world health organization has found out that now there is literally a mutation per country um some are worse some are better um but the the fact that and that's exactly what we said the fact that it's closer to the cold than it is the flu everybody keeps comparing it to the flu as far as vaccines go we need to be thinking more about the common cold um because if you're trying to find a kill-all one-off vaccine like polio where where like the bill and melinda gates foundation just like eradicated it worldwide um epic awesome like right now i posted a thing to dudes and beer today malaria completely stopped by microbe um this is all new news man like malaria is one of those that is like worldwide killer top of the list year after year after year and we finally found a natural microbe that kills it um crazy how long like dude that's been smooth since before the spanish war that we've known about (laughs) that we've known about malaria um like and and for those people who don't realize globally malaria malaria and cholera kill a ton of people yeah malaria malaria uh cholera and giardia um those are those are all water and waterborne illnesses and things that are born by mosquitoes that are born in the water so um the fact that we have finally found that really gives a lot of hope um and you know one of one of the things that i think gives a lot of hope was the daily mail article that came out um and i want to say it was today where scientists find new mutation of coronavirus that mirrors a change in the o3 sars virus that showed the disease was weakening uh because if you remember like we said in in the clip from 258 there earlier folks uh the sars virus was over as a as a pandemic before we had a vaccine like the numbers just plummeted it just it just like a cliff almost dropped off as as opposed to the build-up you know um and 
the the well, fact and we that, never truly had a vaccine for SARS. We spent a bunch yeah. of money on a vaccine. Yep. But the vaccine didn't actually work. Well, and granted, a lot yeah. of the reason why you didn't hear about uh, and uh, why the swine flu didn't get more press than it did, like, mm, I kind of understand. There were a lot of crazy things going on. But at the same time, um, most of the deaths, especially SARS-wise, were foreign. They were Asiatic. Um, it did not really cross that that Atlantic barrier necessarily. Um, there were there was some stuff going on in South America, but the numbers were not like they were in Asia. Everything else, and when it came to the swine flu, um, that that was a little bit more global. That definitely hit home. We had numbers with commas involved here in home. They were at least into the tens of thousands. Um, and and that was another one that before anything happened, uh, numbers started dropping off. They started leveling off. Um, now, granted, our bodies have, like like Madonna is saying, uh, natural immunities. It's it's interesting to see the fact that uh, kids seem to be not as susceptible as adults, and I think that that may just be because of the raging number of antibodies in a kid's body. Like I I I thank God every day that I spent years of my life working with four five and six year olds because i've i've been exposed to who knows what um <laughs> like yeah. my, my immune you know, system that, and, it's like you being a doctor is, and being exposed the way you are you know like you're just exposed to so many people on a mass basis like there's always some kid in the class that's snotty and sick with something <laughs> well and that and that is the key to developing mm. immunity too and I know they talk a lot about herd immunity um, um, in the news. And, of course, the people who are purporting, you know, herd immunity get immediately shot down by people on CNN and MSNBC who want to keep the economy closed as long as possible. Mm. And, you know, the, the way you achieve herd immunity is by young, healthy people getting out there and getting, you know, little bits of exposure at a time. You know, maybe yeah. not walking up to somebody and letting them sneeze in your face and getting yeah. Several or, billion, you know, units or reactivating of, of your RNA. Tinder account. Don't be, don't be having like COVID Tinder parties, y'all. Yeah, <laughs> but you know, just just enough to where your body recognizes, you know, the the virus and starts to slowly form antibodies. Yeah, and then you know, then as that spreads throughout the group, you you start to have herd immunity, and that's one of the things that you know they've decided that. Well, you know, let's reopen the economy because, I mean, yeah, you can, if you stay sheltered inside, you are mm. sheltering your, your immune system. So if you, somebody does come around to have it, your body's basically, it, it's a foreign invader. Your body's not going to recognize it at all. Yeah. So, I mean, that's, that is one of the justifications mm. for reopening. Now, I know a lot of people are saying, well, you know, we should keep the economy closed and keep people out of work until there's a vaccine. Well, let me tell you something. If that's what you're waiting on, then you're going to be out of work for the rest of your life because we haven't successfully made a vaccine to a coronavirus yet. Yeah, and that's so that's we, just it. That's just it. Um, if if you're talking about shutting everything down until we have a a one off one kill virus or or vaccine for the vaccine. virus, rather. Um, but yeah, I'm sorry, I just Freudian slipped that out. Um, if <laughs> if we if if we don't if, like that's what people are expecting and that uh, that is perfectly i believe unrealistic um even even in our last episode we'll get into 262 here in just a second because of this um you know it's it's the fact of and it's been shown now just like we said then um just because you have the vaccine just because you have the antibodies doesn't mean you are not a carrier I have had the chicken pox. That doesn't mean I can't carry it from from a kid that I go see, like my niece, and carry it back home to my son. Right? Yeah. Well, and that's the that's the whole key. And I, you know what? It just really it kind of surprises me the number of people that I, especially on mm. Facebook, that I see are saying, "Well, you know, we should all stay at home and stay out of work and." Until there's a vaccine, and I'm like, I am telling you, you, you we've known the RNA work, sequencing then. of a common cold, which is a coronavirus, yeah. for a century. 
and we don't have a vaccine for it. That's We've right. got to change the vaccine to the influenza, regular influenza, every year. Yep. And even then, it's a guess, and usually it's a wrong guess. But like we yeah. said last time, it's a it's a 20% roll of the dice. It's a 20%. Yep. You know, and then with this thing mut- mutating the way it is, you know, then, you know, so m- maybe you get a vaccine that maybe works in 40 percent of the population yep. to one strain. Well, if that's not the strain you get, then the vaccine's not going to work either. Well, and so, you may get a vaccine yeah. for the four different strains that they put out that year. You get a you get a flu that's totally different that you already have antibodies for. So you're asymptomatic. Then you go meet somebody, shake their hand. Hey, how you doing? Let's do some business. Now they got the flu. Yeah. Like just because you're asymptomatic doesn't mean you don't have it. Just just because you've had it don't mean you can't get it. And and that's what we're starting to see now is people being reinfected. Exactly like we said in episode 262. So, um I'm going to go ahead and break to that audio clip real quick, doc. Uh let's check that out and and hear some of what we said in episode 262. This was March 24th. Uh this was all of a few weeks ago. Um so let's hear the difference between now and then and what dudes and beer called. we have a a different flu shot every year is because it's relatively close every year to the initial virus that we make a vaccine for. Mm. But there's a thing called antigenic shift. And every time that virus kind of starts over again, it mutates to figure out a way where it can get around our immune system to keep on replicating. And that's why that they see what, what flu is going around in Asia they assume that's the flu that's eventually going to come to the West, and then yep. they manufacture the virus, the vaccine around that particular virus. And they have to do that every year because of antigenic shift. Yeah. Now, that is the one good thing is there's two strains of this, this COVID-19, and we don't see it mutating much more. And I think the reason they're not seeing that is this virus is more infectious than the typical flu virus, and I think it has – either modified itself or been artificially modified to be about as contagious as it can be. To know that this virus, uh, before, uh, right after you were on last time, I never did make the dudes and beer called it, but right after you were on last time was the first time that the virus mutated. And we said, get ready for it. It will happen. It's much more close to the common cold than it is the flu. So it's permutations are going to happen much more rapidly. Uh, and within this four month time frame of it existing from December to now, it's already mutated once. So, like you said, the odds of getting a vaccine rapidly may be tough, but the odds of us getting treatments in place, known treatments, known preventatives that work, that help through regular study, um, are really good and you don't get that strain because you got the vaccine doesn't mean you can't be a carrier. Like you can still be a carrier for that strain of the vaccine that you didn't get, you know? Exactly. Um, And, and that's what a lot of people don't understand. They're looking for a miracle vaccine. That's going to stop it. And it's like, you understand of course, that even if there's a vaccine and you get it, that doesn't mean you don't carry it. And welcome back from the Wayback Machine there, Doctor. Uh, It's like there's a really long delayed echo for about four or five weeks. (laughs) (laughs) You know, Um, it's just really strange. And like I said, to have to have seen over the last week that the the U.S. Germ Warfare Department has come out and said, We, we have come up with what we believe to be a presumptive positive test for asymptomatic people. Um, that is really, really fast for just getting your hands on a genome. Like we, we've been, we, we've been in lockdown for a month, man. And granted, whenever we first had you on was right after they'd brought the people from, uh, from the cruise ships 
to Lackland Air Force Base and started bringing them over to the Level 4 facility uh, right down the road near you, right? And, yeah. And, you know, just to, to even think about that, to even think about the fact that we only got our hands on a, on a pure genetic, and it's not even a pure genetic sample. It's like a fifth-hand genetic sample of whatever was altered by the time it got to these people, right? Well, and that's why they were trying to get China yeah. to send them, actually, genetic stock from the laboratory, um, you know, from where it was, where the research was done. Yeah. But China would China refused to do that and refused to do it from, from any countries. And then, mm-hmm. as a matter of fact, tried to say that it was brought over by our military guys. Yep. And then they tried to blame it on Italian soldiers' brain. Because for a lot of you that may not know, right about the time that virus hit, they had what's called the Wuhan Games, and it's a it's a military. Basically, it's the Olympics yeah. for the military, yeah. it's, and, and it's held in Wuhan. Well, a lot of those soldiers initially flew from China to Seattle, Tacoma, uh, and then amazingly enough, Seattle, Tacoma had the first big spike. Well, then, as those soldiers, some of them were asymptomatic, the ones that were sick got better. They all shipped out to their home bases because they were just flying back into Seattle, Tacoma. Yeah. And then you saw then you saw the various hot spots kick up wherever those soldiers went. Now that in con- in conjunction with the fifty thousand people that were sent out of Wuhan before they closed down, before China well, you, closed down which their was, air traffic. Yeah, yeah, and that was that was Chinese New Year. Yeah, where where they should have shut it down beforehand, and then they didn't, um, and that's just a mass number of people traveling. Well, and if you remember, that's also when. Mayor de Blasio in New York City was telling everybody, mm. go down to the, celebrate the Chinese New Year, that this virus ain't nothing. Just go down there and be in the big groups. And Nancy Pelosi was, you hey, know, walking yeah. the streets in California for you Chinese know, New Year and I, all of this. Don't worry about it. Well, then all of a sudden everybody's like, nope, we want you quarantined and I, we're closing parks down and we're closing businesses down. I said, and, it, know, just, I said it last week. That's my favorite thing about my four or five trips a year to Vegas for work is is the decorations for Chinese New Year. It's absolutely gorgeous, John. Um, what they do at the Palazzo, things like that. It's And I mean, hey, you know, it's it's kind of like going, wow, it's, it's really beautiful to see the, to, you know, see, see the Empire State Building lit red for the anniversary of communism. It's beautiful. Um, <laughs> but it is beautiful. And, uh, you know, it is a beautiful time of year, but it was really strange that the government did not lock that down. Um, even travel within their own country. And you know that there would have been separate festivals, everything else, but they really did allow travel into one center and then travel back out of it directly and like we said whether or not they i do not believe that there was an intentional release of any virus whatsoever do i believe that there has been definite um piracy on the high seas because a virus happened oh hell yeah <laughs> Well, and, and, and people have to remember, I know our press makes China out to be that they're just a, a global partner, that we can believe what they say, and we can trust them. And, you know, the bottom line is things in China are way different than they are here. Oh, yeah. You know, under a, under a communist government, you know, they manipulate their currency. They, you know, they, you know, steal our, you know, data and, you know, and design their different things because they can make them cheaper there. They know where Achilles' heel in the United States mm. is greed. Yeah, and uh, and and they know that our companies are going to do everything they can to protect their Chinese interest because they pump a lot of money, especially into media and into entertainment. Most of Hollywood is is yeah. influenced by Chinese money. All of our, just about all of our media Dude, that at least answers we, to Comcast uh, answers we, to Chinese. We held money. off the re- the re release of the reboot of Red Dawn. Like that had to be reshot so that North Korea was the enemy instead of Red China. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that one still boggles my mind. Like, 
Somebody you know, wrote and, and a fictitious us, script and said China's the enemy, and China was like, hey, 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 calm it down now. Yeah. <laughs> well, and, and, and then you have all, all of our companies decided that it's cheaper to have their products made in China and then shipped mm. back here for sale. So all of our oh, medicines, sure. for the most part, now are made in China. Just, yep. I mean, just about, I mean, you know that one of my hobbies is I, I rebuild antique tractors That's right. and older vehicles. Well, you know, all of these International Harvester and Ferguson and old Fords, oh. you know, all of these parts that you get to rebuild these tractors, none of them are made in America anymore. They're all Man. Chinese parts. Well, well, and I can imagine so. I mean, especially whenever it comes to a lot of old school uh, manufacturing techniques, whenever you're talking about die cast, stamp, things like that, they've got that down, Jack. Um, we we have lost that knowledge of fabrication and manufacture. Um, they've got that down pat. And, you know, well, like, and I, well, the re- reason I bring up the antique tractors is I know when you say that they, you know, steal our, you know, our, our corporate intelligence and, yeah. and designs, yeah. it's not just motherboards and computer stuff. I mean, it's like you yep. said, it's die cast and stamp metal, yeah. you know, basic switches and things like that that we use in antique vehicles that are no longer made here. And even, you know, a lot of people, like with these food plants shutting down, a lot of people don't realize a lot of these chicken plants and pork, well, all of the pork processing plants are owned now by pretty much one Chinese company. Yeah. But and, a lot and, of the chicken processing plants actually send the chickens yep. to China to be cleaned and processed, and then they're frozen and shipped back here before they're sold. Yeah, Smithfield so, Farms all of a few years ago. Uh, one of the, one of the nature's... One of the, yeah, like, they had commercials on TV before, like, beef, it's what's for dinner. It, they were the people behind, like, pork, the other white meat, and things yeah. like that back in the day. And, um, like, Smithfield Farm pork commercials were on TV, like, when, like, before the days of, you know, Starkist Tuna and Charlie the Tuna, things like that. And... They were actively bought out by a Chinese conglomerate. And there's there's crazy testimony amongst Congress uh, because they were one of the largest pork manufacturers in the U.S. Um, and it was shortly after that that the the labeling was dropped, um, where where you will not see if your food comes from a foreign market. Um, well, and not, that not is only thing. that, with people. The, the communist government there operates to a whole different beat of a different drummer. Absolutely. And uh, for, for people to <laughs> look at the, the research or the information that comes out of China and say, well, we can trust them. You know, they're probably being straight with us. You can't trust them. And they're never being straight with you. That- I mean, we're talking about a government that actually takes their Muslim population and puts them in re-education camps, yeah. takes the Muslim women, gives them Chinese husbands to try to integrate them into Chinese society, and actually har- harvests his organs from the Muslim population John, in those um, containment camps. John, you know, I, will, for, I, will for Chinese posit, citizens. I will posit this fact, and and that that's the fact that, uh, you know, you, you can't, you should trust the Chinese government about as much as Chinese citizens do. And the only people from the Chinese government that you should listen to are the dead Chinese doctors and government officials. The- and, and for those of your <laughs> listeners who have never heard about what we're talking about with the, the Islamic population there, they're mm-hmm. called the Uyghurs. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And just do any yeah. any cursory Google search on that, and you'll see what's happening to those people in China. Yeah, exactly. And and like I said, if if you want to believe somebody from China, don't believe the media. The media is run by the government. Believe the doctors and the government people and things like that that have come out and said things and are now dead. Um, and the list goes on and on. Literally, just go on to Google and search. Chinese doctor or Chinese whistleblower dead um, and you will get pages of documentation from doctors physicists all kinds of stuff um, about different Chinese programs going on and I'm not saying like like we've said on this show doc uh, we definitely are guilty of that ourselves um, I would I would like to personally thank all of our WMLD listeners for tuning in 
Um, thank you guys so much. If you want to hear the rest of this episode and what we're talking about and the follow up on this, stop on by dudesandbeer.com. You can catch the whole episode. Uh, now, John, what I'd like to do is uh, kind of start getting into a little bit of the the science that we know right now, as well as where things may be going, because like we said, there there is now the the news of a more virulent strain of covid out there um and uh, there is the news of the army prototype test as well as people possibly like gilead um gilead pharmaceuticals making like tons of vaccines that are actively untested like we we did this is a known zoonotic disease and We are not going to test it on animals that are at least related to bats before we test it on people. Like, that's just strange to me. Yeah, and like I've said, if you're you're hoping there's going to be a vaccine along here in the next couple of months and you can get a vaccine and then you can go to start working again, then just go ahead and make sure your unemployment benefits are... Or backed up because yeah. that's that's not gonna not gonna happen. And as a matter of fact, it's that like I said, the same reason that we have to have a new vaccine every year for the regular flu yeah. is the reason there's not going to be a vaccine for this because it's going to mutate around it. And like you said, there's now a more virulent strain that's more contagious um, that's turned up uh, in L.A. Personally, I think that as the summer rolls on, I think it's going to end up relatively seasonal you know, kind of like we mm. see with any other virus but i think there is going to be probably a return with it that maybe won't be so scary because the press will mm. move on to something else and be tired of pushing the covid virus well Plus, it'll be election time well and i so. think yeah, yeah number one it'll be election time number two i think we'll also be second wave tired sadly enough um, and number three, I think I think mostly it, it really comes down to PPE, man. It comes down to personal protective equipment. It comes down to doing like and if you if you remember, folks, there was a cultural shift that happened right after 9-11, right after the tainted envelopes were sent around. Um, the next thing that happened was SARS. And if you recall, if you were somebody that traveled regularly, if you were someone that spent time in airports, um, I myself take at least a good three or four trips a year, at least at that point I was, going back and forth to home, um, now even more. And, you know, you started seeing a lot more face masks from the Asiatic population, things like that. And it wasn't necessarily that they were infectious, it was the fact that they came from an infected country. So they were just being socially responsible. Um, and I think that's what a lot of people are missing out on. Uh, you know, I saw a lot of people making, of course, um, the memes making fun of the guys in Michigan and things like that that were out protesting, wanting things to reopen. They were armed protesters and they had their masks on. And it was one of the, you know, it was like, oh, it looks like Antifa, it looks like terrorists. And it was like, well, I don't know, it looks like a bunch of law-abiding people to me. Um, they're allowed to bring their guns to a protest. That's that's absolutely within the Constitution, within the Constitution of their state. And, you know, aside from that, it's within their state's rules that they have to wear a mask when they're out in public. So they're at the very least being socially responsible with their First Amendment right. Um, and that's just me, uh, putting my open-minded twist on what's happening in the meme media, in the social media realm, things like that. Um, and, and well, and that's what we're down to is it's, we're down to a point where it turns out that it's probably not as fatal as they first were predicting. So you can the first predictions were within 2%. Not that they did, though, like I said, I don't want to diminish the numbers of people that have died. It's horrifying. But, like, I keep trying to tell people, my God, keep positive. Your chances of getting it are small. Your chances of dying from it are even smaller. And that's the words of Sanjay Gupta, man. 
Well, and that's just it. The chances of you losing your life to it are pretty small, but the chances of losing your lifestyle by staying home any longer, or staying out of work any longer, is is pretty much a hundred percent. Yeah. So. Well, and you know that's what we really, really got into in two sixty two, John. Um, not only with you, but with the guests that followed up after you. Like it was an amazing show, and I, th- you know. The one thing that I said more than anything else throughout that is I think that aside from 9-11, horrible, um, a moment that people will who were there and awake for it will never, ever, ever forget. However, your your personal connection to 9-11, pretty slim. Aside from emotional you know, um, the chances of you knowing someone who was affected by 9-11, knowing someone in the towers, uh, knowing someone that was economically fully impacted by 9-11, pretty slim. And that was a horrible, horrible situation that globally changed the travel situation for everyone security wise. However, I think that COVID is really the situation right now where by the end of it all, my friend, we will all know somebody that was personally affected by COVID. Whether they got sick, they knew someone who got sick, they had a family member who got sick, they lost their job, knew someone who lost their job, or had a family member who did. Yeah, I would I would agree. I think that you're going to, well, I mean, Definitely, the entire population has been affected by the quarantine and the shutdown. And you're right. Well, I mean, I'm a physician, so I know plenty of people that have had it. Yeah. Um, As a matter of fact, had uh, three new three new cases diagnosed over the weekend. Oh man. Uh, You know, so I mean, these are you know patients that I know. Um, And and, and so you know, you're talking about kids not getting it. This happened to be two children that got it. And then oh, gave it Jesus. to them, were, and were relatively asymptomatic, and then gave it to their grandmother. Um, oh. But they're all, all all three doing well, and luckily, uh, I caught it early enough to start them on some preventative treatment. So. And and thank God. And just so you know, folks, like uh, Doctor John Hall is a, an anesthesiologist. Like he he deals with people's respiration and oxygen and things like that on a daily basis. Um, if anybody other than maybe a respiratory therapist uh, has a good idea of what's going on, I think he does. Um, and and for you to to be as confident as you are, doctor, um, to to know the things that you do, to to know that um, this is something that we that we can at least, like we've said in past episodes, find, you know, find mitigating circumstances for, find mitigating treatments for, find find ways by which to to treat the average person. I mean, of course, the the people who have pre existing conditions, the people who have uh, irregular conditions, we can expect that irregular result. Um or actually probably expected result. Um, and like I said, if you, if you personally like me, no respiratory therapists out there, folks get in touch with them, call them, say, Hey, how you doing? Check in with them. They are out there right now making what would be the equivalent of some really, really hard battlefield decisions. Um, as far as who gets ventilators, who doesn't give ventilators, that kind of stuff. Um, And that is something that I think amongst first responders and people on the front lines medically that we really, really lose track of, John. Yeah, well, and that's one nice thing in San Antonio. Uh, Obviously, well, and even in New York, as bad as Mm. it got there, it never did completely overwhelm the hospital system. Yeah. And I know here in San Antonio, we still have a lot of hospital beds. We actually we have a ton of hospital beds because, yeah. you know, one of the one of the things with quarantine is, you know, they stopped elective surgeries uh, and elective admissions into the hospital. 
thinking that they were going to need all this hospital space for this million person onslaught of COVID-19. Mm-hmm. Well, that didn't happen. So, you know, when you, when you see the pictures of the overworked nurses in the media and everything, there are some hospitals where that's happening. Sure. Most of the nurses in San Antonio were furloughed and were, are out of work. Yeah. At least were out of work until last week. Um, you know, so, I mean, that's for some of the hardship on the medical community was job loss as mm-hmm. well. It wasn't being overworked. Yeah. Um, but on the, on the treatment in a COVID though, uh, you know, the, one of the things that's kind of still alarming me is the amount of time it takes to get a test back. Mm. So, uh, and, and I'm just speaking from my practice. I'm certainly not speaking for anyone else's physician. And certainly if you get sick, you need to call your doctor and what's and your timetable what been but, on a return for a test? Uh, about three days. Wow. Wow. Yeah, and, so, and in that time, you're just pray, praying and hoping that somebody does the community safe thing and guards themselves. Like, quite well, honestly, it, I'm it, very surprised that I do not hear more music in my surrounding area, because typically with it with it being Cinco de Mayo, I've got at least a good three parties around me. Um, and yeah. my, my, my families that live next door had huge Easter parties, you know, like there were like 20 people next door and I'm not judging nobody do your thing. But I'm pretty sure when I looked over the fence, there weren't 20 people wearing masks. Well, and I can tell you kind of what the way I look at it, at least in my mode of treatment when I'm dealing with a patient is knowing that it takes in minimum two to three days to get a test back for COVID-19. Mm. You can get an influenza A, B, and a strep design test for strep throat back immediately. So when you have a patient come in running a high fever, 102, 103, mm. 104, sore throat, and they come back flu negative and strep negative, then, you know, in, in my mind, that's reason enough to, especially if that person is toxic, if they're sick, is reason enough to go ahead and, and start some form of preventative treatment mm. Uh, mm. while you're while you're waiting and, for the COVID nineteen. No, 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 you no, know no, that's no, that's no, interesting. No. That's interesting that you bring that up because that yeah that is that especially being in the same family, everything else that is a that is a very quick way to at least um, mitigate that response, like we're saying, and make sure that like, at least you're going to preventatively treat somebody and say, Hey, we get like, you at least tested positive for this. Let us keep you aside. Let us quarantine you. Let us start you on treatments. Things will come back within the next 48 hours. Cause I, that's test. That's like the doctor leaves and an hour later, uh, 30 minutes later, like you got a result. Yeah, especially like with with recently when we had the two little kids come in, mm. bad sore throats, bad fever. One of them already you know had the beginnings of some pneumonia. Well, if they're influenza A and B negative and they're strep negative, well yeah. then that leaves one good possibility, you know. So yeah. and and with the the kids for the most part, you know the fever goes away pretty quick and and they bounce back pretty quick. But the grandmother that brought him in, who also started running a fever and having a sore throat, it's going to be a different issue for her. Yeah. So, you know, that's that's the person that you, you go ahead and, you know, and you start at least what we have right now to be some form of, of a preventative. Now, you know, once it's in your lungs and, and you're older and you're getting pneumonia, then certainly you need to call your doctor and see about getting into the hospital. Absolutely. Um, because, because once it's in your lungs then you are going to need remdesivir. That's, you know, that is showing some promise. Yep. Now, it's it's it, it's not turning out to be the wonder drug that everybody was hoping it would be. It's, you know, it's not a 100% effective cure-all by any it, means. It's, you what, know, a 30 to 40% now, at best. Just curious, what do you, what do you, especially as a respiratory therapist, Doc, and know, you, you know, because, and just so you know how deep he goes, folks, whenever I had him on 258, um, God, I guess that's 10 weeks now. And then 262 after that, um, his exact words to me off air were, you sound a little tight. You okay there, buddy? Um, <laughs> and like I told him, it's, it's, it's the world around me and my extracurriculars, doc. 
Um, there is there is nothing wrong with me. I'm good. These are utterly my extracurriculars that uh, are making me sound this way. Um, it, but oddly enough, um, there's information coming out of France. There's information coming out of a few places that nicotine users may be knocking some stuff out. Yeah, and we had actually figured that out a long time ago, that, that nicotine does seem to attenuate the virus. And, no um, THC, I'm sorry to say, folks. We have nothing on THC. Imagine that. Because <laughs> they, did, they did see that people with, with nicotine patches yeah. seemed to fare better than people that were on. Now, not smoking, that's a different animal. Smoking Absolutely. inflames your lungs. It makes you yes. more predisposed to, to the virus. But yeah. Nicotine patches and like Copenhagen in your mouth, you know, if the virus was to try to enter, you know, the, the nicotine does mm. seem to attenuate the virus pretty quickly. But, you know, it's like my grandmother always said, you know, you swallow enough of that Copenhagen, you'll never have worms. You know? That's like, that's right. That's right. Um, <laughs> you, you drink enough gin and tonic or enough whiskey, you'll kill anything in you. Um, yeah. <laughs> you'll have a you'll have a number of other problems but boy howdy will will you sing like an angel uh but now that they'll now they've got the antibody test that's out now too which you know I'm, I'm hoping they'll actually have enough of those antibody tests to do that widespread and get it down and right now the antibody test they have right up right now is not perfect but if they can get an antibody test i think you're going to see that a lot of the people here have already been exposed Oh yeah, yeah. Like I, I would love to get one. Like I said, my my immune system is pretty raging. It's pretty rare that I am sick with anything as far as a cold, a flu, a bug, anything unless it's something that I ate, or unless it's my allergies or a migraine. Um, it's it's pretty rare for me to miss anything. Um, and I'm I'm lucky for that. I would like to have a Madonna test done to find out if I have the Madonna bodies in me, um, because you know why not? But uh, you know, for me, it's it's really the fact of like you're saying there, the and like Dr. Fossey was saying, like Dr. Sanjay Gupta was saying, there are a lot of people really going into the horribly horribly negative realms of their mind doc um with this and and believe me you know me uh we have we have conversations via text man i consider you friend at that point um (laughs) and i i would i would love to go crazy dark with this but i just can't i can't I see too many instances where much like SARS, hey, we came up with a vaccine. It stopped just before we did. Um, Same thing, same thing with H1N1. We came up with the vaccine. It stopped just before we did. Um, This thing is giving up the same protein markers. It's doing it. It's really showing the same trend. I'm not saying that we won't come up with a vaccine. I'm just saying that there are going to be a lot more permutations of this. There are going to be, it's, it's going to be a totally different story than H1N1, than SARS, than all of that kind of stuff combined. Um, but is, is it going to be like the, the matrix? Is it's going to, is, is it going to be like the human killer virus and, and zombie time? No, no, I don't think we're going to have the apocalypse out of this, my friend. Um, Dis, despite any any God's altar being dug up in January, uh, I I really don't see this being the end of mankind, the end of time as we know it, um, the end of business as we know it. I think it's going to be a big redefinition point for a lot of us. I think that we as a society are going to have to come to a point that a lot of doctors do that a lot of that a lot of facilities do where we have to do regular regimented cleaning or we have to take care of this stuff um, where we have to be careful for ourselves and others even I myself as a business am looking at the fact of purchasing a bunch of uh, elastic face masks that will take an N95 filter 
and having them branded with my company name on it and just sending it to my technicians. If you choose to wear it once we reboot, feel free. You know? Um, well, and well, and you know I've got a, a buddy of mine staying with me, and, yeah. and he's somewhat of a germ- germaphobe. And uh, when he, you know, first started staying with us, you know, he was washing his hands 20 times a day and going through a roll of paper towels. And he's like, man, well, I don't want to catch that coronavirus. And I told him, I said, well, you know, the only way you're going to catch it is from me, you know, because I'm not quarantined. I'm having to go to the office every day, go to the hospital every day. You know, so, I mean, trust me, you're going to know if you get it because the only person you can get it because you're not leaving the house. Yeah, Uh, I'm going to show symptoms way before you do, my friend. (laughs) So (laughs) I said, the the only way you're going to get it is get it from me. And and he's down in his elderberry and his apple cider vinegar. And, you know, he's like, well, that's going to build up my immune system. And I said, well, you know. What builds your immune system is being out and being exposed. That's to right. Things. Yeah. You know, there, there's not a natural berry or anything that, that hey, really strengthens your immune system. Your immune system is strengthened by exposure to antibodies. There's a reason you why know, parents so. back in the day had chicken pox parties. I am not. Hey, hey, everybody. Um, I know I said it on air that I wanted. And I want to say it might have been with you, John Hall, where I said that I wanted to do the Lysol challenge. And 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 have people like, you know, show myself inhaling a bottle of Lysol and look at where we're at now. I am not advocating that, people. Um, <laughs> none of this is a call to action. No, no. Oh, yeah. I'm, I'm out there, bro. I'm telling you. Um, the curve is right there. I am on the crest with the surfboard. Believe me. Um, but it's one of those. This is not a call to action, but I'm just I'm just here to say, like. Yes, it is that herd immunity. Yes, there's a reason why our parents put us through chicken pox parties as kids, things like that. Um, whenever you hear about well, the first kid in the what, class, what like, yeah, don't go having COVID parties. Don't go. Don't go getting your COVID strange on things like that with with Tinder and all that kind of stuff, folks. Let's be socially responsible. Well, now what worried me with the initial quarantine stuff. Is yeah, you can flatten the curve by by staying home. Mm. The problem is, you know, like well, where I live, you know, realistically, had I been quarantined, I could probably make it in my house for a month without sure. going to a store. You know, but I live out in the country. Yep. I've got a garden. I've got meat in the freezer. I hunt, and um, but most people can't. You know, most people yeah. live in apartments or regular neighborhoods, and you know, they may have enough food on hand, hand to last a few days. But, you know, during the quarantine, the, the grocery store shortened their hours from 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. Yep. You know, H-E-B, at least in our area, H-E-B and Walmart. And so what you did is you locked a bunch of people in their homes, took them out of work, and then funneled them into grocery stores, you know, from yeah. 8 to 8, you know, shorten the hours where you couldn't even spread it out over a 24-hour period. So, I mean, you your chances of being infected going to H-E-B with – you know, 10,000 other people in the store at the same time yeah, are really not much different than maybe if you're going to work and if you have an office or, you know, at least if you're in cubicles that are six feet apart, probably was going to yeah. be no more of a risk for you than going to Walmart or HEB where you're touching the produce that everybody else has handled yep. to find the perfect avocado. That's and, right. You know, and, and squeeze the loaves and, of bread to find you know, the perfect loaves be, of bread. Before you touch your mouth, before you touch your nose, before you touch your eyes or a mucous membrane, you wipe your hands. You wash your hands. You sanitize them. You do something, you know. Um, and it, it really is, It you know, um, it's, it's interesting how over the last numerous years we've seen, and you brought up hepatitis a little while ago and herpes, Um Herpes is one of those, it's, it's it, not to get tasteless folks, but it is considered the gift that keeps on giving. Um, it's, it's one of those that uh, literally just about every human being has it in some way, shape, or form. Like warts are, are a visible form of a type of herpes. Um, there, there are numerous forms of it, whether or not you have herpes simplex 10, herpes C, things like that and whether or not you infect people is different um like the commercials say it's a hey it's not that i don't have it it's whether or not i have a flare-up today right um yeah 
And that's how we literally have to treat ourselves in this society, Doc, um, is, is the fact of it's not whether or not I have it, it's whether or not I have a flare-up today. That's really the mentality that we need to get into, where if you go to Walmart, wear a mask. Feel free to go to Walmart. You don't have to wear gloves. You can gladly sanitize your hands before you touch your eyes, nose, throat, ears, any mucous membrane where it could permeate into your body. But wear a mask to make sure that none of that spittle is flying out in the air, to make sure that if you sneeze, it's located inside of you, not outside. Anything that you can do to mitigate really your response to the outside world. Not necessarily the outside world's response to you, right? And and that's really where this whole um, mystique of masks from Asiatic countries in 03, whenever SARS started happening, it wasn't that they were necessarily worried about other people. It's the fact that they came from a SARS-infected country, the least they could do was wear a mask when traveling somewhere else. Well, and there's and there's a lot of the Asian kind. You know, my wife lived in Japan. For Absolutely. Many years. Yeah, and uh, and she wore a mask every day, but they wear masks there every day also because of the pollution. So, well, sure. You know, Absolutely. Tokyo, you know, at any given day, you know, there's a, a layer of smog like you see in Mexico City. So, I mean, the Asian population had gotten used to wearing masks every day years ago, even before SARS. Oh, yeah. But... You know, and, and then what I thought was kind of wrong, our government to come out initially and say, well, you know, you don't need a mask, you know, just, you know, and the reason they were doing that is they knew China had already hoarded most of the PPE. Yeah. So, and, and a lot of our PPE came from China. Well, they weren't shipping any out. As a matter of fact, they were hoarding the rest of the world's PPE. So the reason they recommended that people not have to wear a mask wasn't because they didn't already know that it would transmit through fomites and, and droplets it was they, they wanted to make sure there were masks available for hospital workers who that's were right going to be seeing patient after patient after patient but then once masks became more available then all of a sudden it was okay for the general population to wear a mask so yeah yeah precisely and you know like i said we we ourselves as people have have to mitigate as much as possible. We have to consider ourselves personally responsible. Um, just just consider yourself infectious. That's that's really the easiest way to do it. Um, and it's not necessarily that you can't be out in public. It's just that you you can't be emitting things to people out in public. You know, um, which is really what that mask is about. It's to mitigate your sneezing. It's to mitigate your your spittle from talking or coughing, uh, things like that. Um, you can, well, you, and the one cool thing is I had a lot of my friends uh, that once they had to wear a mask everywhere, they were like, man, now we see what you go through when you're having to wear this thing for six hours straight in a long time. Hey, and I'm like, yeah, I, you know, it gets, a, it gets a little hot breathing your own CO2 for I, six hours. I, hey, I, I made the joke the other day, literally, uh, with quotes like, no, you can't wear your ninja mask to school, son. Everyone's going to make fun of you. Uh, look at it now. Like, yeah. <laughs> I've, I've been looking for reasons to wear a ninja mask in public for years. Uh, you know, well, you know in, in, any, in any other year, you walk into a bank with a mask no. on. You what's, on it. what's hilarious, <laughs> Michael Cargill. Owner, owner of Central Texas Gunworks was talking about that the other day. He was like, they were talking about wear your mask when you go to the bank. Like, I'm a black man in America. I don't think I'm walking into the bank with a mask on. I don't, I don't think that's going to happen. <laughs> like, pardon me. You can give me the fine for not wearing my mask. I am not wearing my mask as I walk into the bank. <laughs> well, and I don't have to tell you, you know, I, I, I wear a mask every day. In, oh, in yeah. Program. But uh, but the first time I had to just walk into the store with a mask on, mm-hmm. I mean, it feels a little weird, you know. It does. It does. It feels really strange, man. It is. It is very surreal. Uh, just the just the general feeling. Like I said, um, I've I've been looking for a reason to wear ninja mask for years. Like, give me a reason to put a balaclava on. Let's go. Uh, <laughs> but 
Uh, well, and if you saw in Michigan, there was those two guys that <laughs> murdered the security guard at a oh dollar store because he, because they he told him to put their mask his on. Wife. And they didn't want to. Well, and what got me with that, and here's here's the real issue, folks. You you hear these stories, you you read the headlines, um, and it, it really sounds like somebody like with a conceal and carry, all kinds of stuff. What happened was this lady came in with her kid to the dollar store. The security guard said, your child needs to wear a mask. And she said, no, nah, I don't think so. And he turned around to the clerk and said, don't serve this person unless they're both wearing masks, because that's the law. Um, they left. They went home. They told their husband. Their husband and their brother came out to the store to confront the security guard about, quote, disrespecting their wife and sister. And while one of them confronted the other and said, hey, security guard, why'd you say my wife couldn't buy anything without my daughter wearing a mask? The other one shot him in the back of the head. Uh, that is literally probably hands down the most horrifying story humanity wise i have heard and i don't know how many years john hall um and and i mean when 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 michael cargill posted it originally i reposted it to dudes and beer and i read it but there was not that detail in it and i i, I read this detail after the security footage had been viewed numerous times from numerous sources um and and to hear that to hear that that's what disturbs me my friend like as two calm cool-headed individuals right here right now talking about crazy possibilities talking about horrible things that we know our government has done that, that we know they play with viruses we know they do these things we know you're on regularly talking about how how our government invades people's privacy with with electronic harassment but man to know that somebody shot someone in the back of the head because they were like please put a mask on your baby that's that's just like the one of the most absent of humanity moments that i've ever heard in my life and that's what disturbs me. That is that is the gut wrenching, deep down point we have gotten to as a society. Well, and, and you know, in my office, what we do is you have to have a mask on, obviously, to come in. Mm. You know, only a certain number of people are allowed in at a time, um, and we do check your temperature. So yeah, and when we first started having to do that. Most people were pretty compliant with it. Now, I did have a couple of patients that came in, and you know, they were 100 degrees, you know, yeah. on their temperature check or, or didn't have a mask. You know, we always kept masks there. Well, if you need a mask, we'll give you one to put on, but you got to put it on. I only, out of all the people I see, I think I only had two that really, really complained about being sent home because they had an elevated temp. You know, and one of them was 101. And I said, uh, you know, we can't let you in. And, you know, he, yeah. of course, you know, stomped his feet and bitched. And he's, you know, I'm going to go to another doctor. And I'm hey, like, man, that's, that's three degrees over. Yeah. Have fun with that. Good luck. Yeah. You won't yeah. even get into an ER at that point. No, like, that's far no, beyond it. deviation on the instrument. But so I will have to say that most of my most of my patients tolerated all those restrictions pretty well. But that that did break my heart when I saw that story. I think that was in Michigan, wasn't it? That uh, were the Dollar yeah. General store. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, you know, and unfortunately, just, and unfortunately, they don't have a death penalty. So, well, yeah, that's you know, um, that's neither here nor there. It's it's really the point of just the straight loss, hum, loss of humanity. You know, like you're you're going to shoot somebody because they were concerned about the health of everybody in a place, um, because they were concerned about your sister coming in and obeying the law with their child you know um and like i said it goes right back to that mentality of us versus them right back to that mentality of the people that were making comments about hey man you know you can consider it whack 
if if you think people bring a semi-automatic rifle to a protest, it it's their right in most states in the union. You know, um, and 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 I challenge you to find a a rally where that happens, where there is a problem and a shooting happens. Um, I've I've yet to really see one, but aside from that. Um, what I saw was a bunch of people that were obeying the local law and exercising their rights. The local law was you don't wear a mask, you will get fined. You don't wear a mask, you will get arrested. Um, and it, it really well, is. And, and, and some of, and some of the reasons people were protesting too, is it's one thing for the government to force a lockdown or a quarantine, sure. but if they're going to do that, they need to abide by their same rules. Yeah. You know, I can't tell you. Have, uh, I saw at least mayor, a good five DPS officers pulling down. people. Out. Of, yeah. The other, the was it the governor of mm-hmm. I think the governor of Michigan sending you know yeah. his, well family member to Florida. Yeah, <laughs> so, I've I've seen a know, good five could, DPS officers on the road having people pulled over talking at their window with no PPE on. Yeah, they didn't have a they didn't have a face mask on. And they were straight up wearing a badge from the state, no less yep. than three feet apart from somebody asking them their business at a window. Now, why wasn't that often? Now, granted, granted, um, much like I've told my wife about seeing city workers or contractors out working on city property, doing construction, um, being being that, quote, essential employee, um, why aren't they wearing it? That's their personal decision. Guaranteed, much like any back brace required by OSHA, um, you're told where the back braces are. Feel free to grab one on your way out. You know, um, but yeah. do you have to wear one on the job site? That's utterly up to you. Guaranteed, they provided you one or the option of using one and told you where to get one before you left for the day. Um, but do you have to wear it on job site? That's a different story. Um, and that really does come down to personal choice. It really does come down to, you know, personal freedom. Like I, I would love to just call the law on my neighbor because they had a 30 person party like three times in three weeks, John. I just in good conscience as an American cannot. I can't. We live in America. We we live in the country where if you want to make up, wake up daily and make 18 horrible decisions every hour you are awake, go for it, man. It's America. You can make the most horrible decision you want to today. That is your choice. <laughs> you know? <laughs> and 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 it's hard for me to toe the line and say this is America. It's the land of the free, home of the brave, uh, and and say that we're we're allowed to do these things, and yet still at the same time be like, "Hey, yo, neighbor, let's be socially responsible." You want to have the party? Cool. How about some masks at the door as people walk in? You know, like feel free to give everybody a mask as a party favor, like. Uh, you know, and to me, it's just the social responsibility, making sure that we're taking care of ourselves as we go out in public, that we're taking care of our neighbor, that we're we're doing what we can to mitigate the situation. Um, and unfortunately, uh, our society is not built that way. Uh, we do not have the the same consideration for most people. Uh, most people are not going to, uh, whenever I walk around the store, most of the time, at least a good half of people have no masks on, none whatsoever. Uh, so as a healthcare professional, as someone out in the middle of this, um, faced with it on the daily, what do you, what do you actively see as our recourse as where we may end up in the next few months? I think you're, as things are new, I mean, they already have started here in Texas, you know, that matter of fact, we mm. went and ate in a restaurant for the first time in a month, nice. my wife and I, 
And, uh, and of course they're doing their 25% occupancy. So I don't know how they're going to make it doing that. They're still mm-hmm. going to have to sell a lot of takeout, you know, yeah. to make it. Um, and they're doing the disposable menus and the sterilized utensils and, and everything and, yeah. and making sure that, you know, the mask is on and then the waitress or the waiter server comes to the table. Um, but I think as cases continue to drop and you'll see people, whether it's allowed or not, just people stop doing the mask hmm. thing. I mean, it's, and it's already kind of started, although I've, I've noticed at Walmart and HEB, they've actually clamped down a little more, Yeah, you know, since, since things have reopened. I know yeah. um, both of Walmart and HEB by my house um, are, you know, clicking the number of people that are going in and yep. abiding by the square footage rules and making you watch, you know, put hand sanitizer on and a mask on before you go in. Yeah. Um, and if you've noticed, I made this mistake. I went in thinking, well, I should still be able to check out at the garden area. I needed a 50 pound thing of, um, the little pellets for my pellet smoker. And, uh, of course went in there and didn't get a cart and I got my pellets, walked over to the garden district garden area where I thought I'd be able to check out. And I'm like, no, all the mm. checkout is through the, the one entrance. So I got to carry a 50 pound bag yeah. of pellets around the store. Yeah, that's right. So, that's right. Make sure to get one of those clean carts for a couple for you. hours. <laughs> so i've got, got my workout that morning at the That's Walmart, right. but, uh, um, but i i think as time goes on and we see the cases start to decline then you're going to see kind of society come back you know to what was pretty close yeah. to a norm i mean you're still going to have the people who are really scared to get it that are going to maybe want to continue to wear a mask well uh, I, I think you and, and and i don't fault those people I do not fault no. them. It's much like the people, like I said, coming from Asiatic countries that we have seen for years and years, doctor, and travel and everything else that are still wearing masks. It's just a point of social responsibility. Don't judge people for it. Um, that's it. You know, it's it is what it is. Let it be. Um, if masks are relegated in your area, don't put up a fuss, folks. Just. Just do what you need to do. Um, it's it's for everybody's benefit. It really is. I'm, I, you know, I'm not a fan of it. But anytime I leave the house, I've at least got my little elastic mask on to be able to put on whenever I go through the drive through or go through the self checkout or go through Walmart, things like that. Um, it's it's not a horrible inconvenience, but it really is a presence of mind issue. You know, um, and it's it's much like how many times a day do you wash your hands after you touch things, you know? And if, um, and if things reopen and you're going to restaurants again, and that's where the mask wearing, at least yeah. in the short, we don't have a, a huge flare up, but things yeah. have to reopen. They I mean, do. you can't you can't keep people out of work indefinitely, or no. won't have any businesses to reopen. No. Ab- absolutely, we do have to we do have to try to get back to a point of normalcy as fast as possible. Um, now, uh, now, do we need to be reopening movie theaters? I think that's a bit much. Um, do we need to be reopening restaurants in a picnic capacity? That kind of stuff, where it's a limited capacity maximum of 20 people at a time in a restaurant, you know, social distancing. My wife and I today were talking about how hard would it be to rent a main ballroom and only have 500 instead of the 2,000 it holds, you know, and have yeah. have two people at a at a 10-foot wide table, you know, that kind of stuff with masks on, everything else. You know, um, it, 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 it would not be hard to downsize things, to make things small, to start moving back to a port of normalcy. Um, and we really do need to consider these options. We really do need to think about it. Um, I'm not saying that we need to be reopening barbershops. Don't get me wrong. You can, those of you who know me know uh, what I'm rubbing on my head right now on camera is way beyond belief on my head um you know me john i love my barber um (laughs) but do i need to be going to my barber right now i don't think it's essential you know um and that's just me that's just me 
um, those are the facts. You know, speaking of it. speaking of that, I had yeah. a, a patient come in today, and because I haven't been to my barber lately, and I and I actually <laughs> like going not only for a haircut but mm. for a beard trim. Mm-hmm. And uh, and she's had the barber shop shut down for a while, and I had a guy come in. And he goes, you know, who you remind me of, and I was ready to hear um, Popovich. Because I get that a lot. Mm. I go, you look like Greg Popovich, okay. the coach from the Spurs. Yeah. Now, I don't know if that's a compliment or not, but I get that a lot. But because of the, the white beard. But uh, I had a guy come in and he goes, you know, you remind me of. And I said, who's that? And he goes, Abraham Whistler from Blade. You know, <laughs> oh, oh, my God. I said, man, where's my, where's my barber? Where's my barber open back up? <laughs> that's better than some options. That's better than some. Um, <laughs> Because at least that's like, yeah, at least he's a badass, you know? <laughs> for, those, for those of your listeners who don't remember, Abraham Whistler was Chris Christopherson's Chris character yeah. in the movie Blade. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, well, Doctor, thank you so much for taking the time tonight. Thank you so much for taking the time always. You know, as I went through and prepped these episode clips, things like that, it, it really brought me to a point of searching the website um, and and with the way that we have been kind of redefining things and putting things out there lately, you know, uh, thank you so much for always being there. Thank you so much for always coming on the show, talking about topics like this, other topics like your book, Guinea Pigs, Technologies of Control, Targeted Individuals, things like that. Um, you really did help redefine the focus of this show. Um, and I want to thank you for that. And I want to thank you for always taking the time to come on, be on with our audience and take the time to break these things down, not only scientifically, but hypothetically and where we may be going, you know, uh, like I told my wife today, um, and like she said, like, what, what? Why do you have to be able to call this stuff so easily? Um, and it's it's kind of scary sometimes to be able to look at all of it, process it, filter it, and kind of make sense of it and see it and see it in front of your eyes and see the fact that like we're we're presently right now in for a decent crest and then probably what may be a, a decent drop off. Um, by all predictions, by all models, by, by all things that have happened in the past. So uh, thank you so much always for coming on, taking oh, the time with our audience, Doctor. I always love being on your show. And just one parting comment I'd like to make to your listeners. Mm-hmm. As we re we are going to see a slight bump up in numbers mm-hmm. because people are going to be in close proximity again. Yep. Don't let the media scare you when they start going, see, That's right. we opened too soon and now That's we're right. spiking again. You're not going to spike again, but you are going to see an uptick in, uptick in numbers as people go back to work and people go back into restaurants. It'll level off again after that. So yeah. don't let the media scare you. Because the media right now, I think, is scaring more people mm. than they're helping. So. Yeah. Yeah. And that's a, that's a lot of why I like doing this episode with you and why I like talking about this stuff with you, John, is because we really do get to kind of break that apart. We really do kind of get to scientifically break it down and say there are some issues going on. But overall, 98.2 percent people, we do not need to be panicking. We're going to be OK. You're going to be okay. Your family's going to be okay. 98.2 percentile. They're going to be okay. You're going to be okay. Um, What really matters, much like anything in the world, is our karate-like reflex response to this situation and how we react to it. Um, And I think that's, that's really the takeaway here is that we need to control ourselves. We need to temper ourselves. We need to step two steps back and look at the forest and the trees at the same time. So uh, on that note, once again, thank you as always for joining the conversation, doctor. Tell everybody where they can go 
to get their cop other than the dudes in beer store where they can go to the, yeah. get their copies of technology, guinea pigs, technologies of control, uh, satellite terrorism, a new breed, everything else. Uh, all of that, you can Barnes and Nobles or Amazon.com, uh, guinea pigs, technologies of control, a new breed, satellite terrorism in America. And as soon as my publisher is up and running again, uh, my third book, the fourth branch. So. Oh man, I had no idea that you were that far along in the third book. Are you serious? Yeah, yeah. Just waiting, waiting oh. for my transcription people and editing people, and waiting for uh, a couple of releases to come through from the government. Because some of the stuff I'm using on that, because you, know, you know, I always yeah use some classified information. I have to get permission yeah um, to use that. So yeah. And I, I cannot wait for that. Thank you so much for making that announcement here. Um, my God, even even as much as we text back and forth, I don't think that news hit me uh, that you that you had a new book that close to coming out. So I'm well, excited. And it was supposed to actually be ready to come out in January, but mm. it's going to be considerably delayed now. Everybody's sure. still shut down. So. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well. Once again, as always, uh, please do hold the line as we close things out. Thank you so, so, so much for coming on, Dr. John Hall. While you are online, checking out all the great work of Dr. John Hall, checking out his book, Guinea Pigs, Technologies of Control, as well as uh, Satellite Breed and New Terrorism, make sure to stop on by dudesandbeer.com. That is where you can check out all the episodes. That's where you can check out episode 258, episode 262, where we drew that great Dudes and Beer call that info from tonight. That is where you can find the Knowledge Vault with all of our declassified documents, things that we talk with Dr. John Hall about regularly. Go by and check it out, everybody. Uh, while you're online checking that out, make sure to stop on by HC Universal Network, hcuniversalnetwork.com, as well as audibletrials.com forward slash dudes and beer. If you like reading like I do, check Thanks it out. Thanks for listening to we'll this talk episode you soon. of the Dudes and Beer Podcast. If you can't be good, be good at it. To listen to our we'll audio talk to you soon. Bye bye. chat with us live, download the official Dudes and Beer app for Android and iDevices, available on Google Play and iTunes markets. For more episodes, content, and information, visit us online at dudesandbeer.com. You can also find our episodes on Breach.tv, iHeartRadio, Spreaker, SoundCloud, iTunes, YouTube, Stitcher, or your favorite podcast service. Dudes and Beer is a proud member of the HC Universal Network family of podcasts. For more about our sponsors and other podcasts on this network, visit hcuniversalnetwork.com. Thanks for listening, everybody. And until next time, drink responsibly.